What up, Mark Berdick and Willie? How are you today, my friend? Dave Cooper Live. Your audio is perfect. Today Thank is you. perfect. It is the final week of summer, and I'm excited. I'm excited, too. We're going to have a great show today. As always, BS Friday with Mark Berenick and Willie and I are going to bring you the best and the brightest from the building science world. And then there's a couple others that may join us as well. All Who right. knows? So Dave was Dave was uh, in Georgia this week. Are you still in Georgia? I am not in Georgia. I am back in the new studio here working uh, from the desk, still trying to get things set up. But, you know, it's coming along quite nicely, but it, it's, you know, taking some time to get through it. But we were in uh, Georgia at the Building Systems Summit with the NAHB, and I was the MC, And it was absolutely amazing. When we asked how many people were there, three quarters of the room put their hands up. That's how many new attendees showed up. So it was great to see that many attendees learning about building systems and building science and everything else we spoke about. Terrific. And uh, yesterday, uh, I was speaking at the Passive House Canada with our friend Chris Ballard and Luis. Um, It was prefab on the rise. So Dave... And Mark, Mark and Dave always like the building science side, but it's interesting when the offsite side and the passive house side come together because we've been saying it for a minute. Yeah, we've been saying it for more than just a minute. It's going to happen. It needs to happen. It will happen. And it is starting to happen. So that's super exciting. All right, Mark, what do we got going on today here, man? We started a few moments late doing some tech stuff and, you know, just we got carried away BS and behind the scenes like we do sometimes. So what we have going on today is an opportunity for Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, LinkedIn, and YouTube to likey, 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 and we have a surprise for our guest. Ooh. What kind of surprise is that? Uh, We have some people that um, that are going to come forward and control, so I'm, I'm at your mercy, brother. I love it. I love it. I love it. We are live. Like Mark said, please hit that like and share button. And if you are not subscribed to our YouTube channel, today is a perfect day to do that. We are getting over 10,000 hours every 28 days watched right now. It's absolutely amazing. It's growing fast and we're having a lot of fun. All right. So should we bring in uh, the the, the special uh, introduction? Let's do it, Dave. Sean Saint. Oh, more. He is a saint at heart. I don't know if he's a saint in real life, but I never really got to hang out with him. So we will find out. I One tried being here, gentlemen. Good morning. What do you see behind me, Mark? What do you see that? The, the red, red, door. red, red, red door, 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 door of, of, it's, of, of, true, 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 true. It's one of those days in our job site where uh, we're we're getting into it. We're going to see how this house performs. Final blow order test. See All what right. happens. See what leaks well, uh, occur. Oh. Or don't occur, or yeah, or don't occur. I love the look. Look at the video motion. We we got a Sorry. we got a next gen Dave Cooper in front of us with the I back. Know, look at board. it. Don't trip, Sean. Look out. Uh, uh, beautiful. So he realized the Wi Fi stops about halfway from the uh, garage. So I'll just stay right here. So yeah, Sean, that's a good idea. Good you, idea. You have forty minutes to introduce our next uh, our, our next presenter, and uh, that way he'll be mad at you because there won't be any time for him to present. Totally. I could speak all day about this particular gentleman. So, again, you guys are lucky to have an individual today that is probably most experienced in offsite, experienced in architecture. Uh, been hanging out with him for two years every Wednesday night. He is one of the uh, loyalist fans of the Passos Accelerator Live, where we get to hear his banter from either his, um, his home or he takes a low carbon method to his cabin. Uh, but this in, in individual is uh, a writer. Uh, I'm going to say he's a New York bestseller. I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, I'll let him tell us if it is. But he's got a lot to offer. And if you uh, want more of him, pretty much every day, you go to his uh, his lovely report that he puts out, and you can read lots about him. So, everyone, please join us today. We've got a special individual here, Mr. Lloyd Alter. Mr. Alter, the floor is yours. Tell us about all the great stuff you're up to. Wow, that's a great introduction. By the way, there's an arm sticking through your blower door. Yes, it happens. <laughs> oh. it's, 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 it's those ones where we have to fix the leak, you know. Ah, okay. 
Well, that was an amazing introduction, and thank you so much. I it's uh, it's great it's great to be here, and it's I uh, met Mark over all of this time through those Wednesday nights as well, and so uh, great gang. What do we do? How do we so, start? Well, it's going to be pretty simple. We want to know everything about you from the moment you were born to this very moment in time. Do not leave out any of the good stuff from the hospitals, or we will bring on a family member so they can tell us all the good, embarrassing things about you. However, Lloyd, you only have two minutes. Minutes to do it. The floor is yours. Then we'll hop okay. into your presentation. My Sean, mother wanted, thanks, brother. My, my mother wanted me to be an architect, so I went to architecture school, and I wasn't very good at it. And I became an architect, and I hated every building that I ever designed. So uh, when one of my clients, a developer, asked if I knew anyone he could hire to manage developments, I said, "Sure, I'll become a developer." And then had a development company, which I built a couple of really interesting buildings and then had the usual fight with partners. And I was no longer a developer. So I went to Canada's biggest prefab manufacturer and said, you know, I just hate on-site construction. It's awful. Let me hire the best architects and let's do high design prefab. And this was in Ontario, Canada, where it's so far apart that doing modular construction, I was getting people calling me from California and I said, um, I can get to the border. So, but what happened is I started writing about prefab to promote what I was doing before there were even blogs. I was doing an everyday updated site. And before I knew it, everybody who was interested in prefab back in 2002 was reading my website. Word blog hadn't been invented yet. And when the first blogs came up, like Tree Hugger in 2004, I sent them tips and got to know them and finally said, hey, why don't you write for us? And then they said, hey, why don't you write for us full time? And I turned out to be a better writer than a prefab salesman. So that's how I ended up writing instead of standing out in the cold trying to build prefabs. So that's my story. And you're sticking to it? I'm sticking to it. And thank oh, you and for joining way, somebody, us. Somebody saw me speak and said, hey, uh, we, have a we have a hole in our program for teaching sustainable design at Ben Ryerson University. So the next thing I knew, I was a professor as well as a writer. And then last year, if you can put on my first slide. I can. I put out a book called Living the 1.5 Degree Lifestyle. And I was going to be doing what was pretty much my standard presentation of this book today. And then yesterday I wrote a post on Tree Hugger that was very controversial. And I just said, this is an opportunity. I got to work. I was up half the night changing all the slides, cut the stuff about the book down to about a third, and then added all the stuff that I wrote about yesterday that was so <laughs> controversial which is what is the ironclad rule of carbon? So yes. uh, shall we just then go? Shall yes, I just start the presentation? Okay, so a lot of slides. I do them really quickly, but here There's only go. 140 of them, so grab yeah. a bottle of whiskey, sit down. We're going to yeah. be here for only 30 minutes, believe it or not. He's quick. Let's so everybody, it. you probably all know this mitigation curve that we have to stay under 1.5 degrees or two degrees in that case, 1.5 degrees, we have to start reducing our carbon really fast. And this is the mitigation curve to stay under 1.5 degrees. And a lot of people say, ah, we've blown it already. The ambitious goal is gone. Why won't anyone admit it? Well, I won't admit it because there are still things we can do. Um, Two, three years ago, I read about this Finnish study, the 1.5 degree lifestyle study, which was really interesting and talked about how the majority of carbon emissions are actually under our personal control, what they call lifestyle emissions. Uh, and they said the average in the world was about 72%. The rest is government making F-35s and bombing people and uh, doing things like that. But 72% but of it was roughly stuff we could control. And they did a chart in that that talked about how our personal carbon emissions, our portion of the global budget had to start dropping really fast. And they said by 2030, average person on earth should be 2.5 tons of carbon a year, by 2050, one ton a year. Now, half the world lives under 2.5 tons a year right now, but they're all starving. They're all in countries that they're, you know, they don't have enough energy, they don't have enough to live, but the fact of the matter is that we're the real outlier up at the United States and Canada, way up at 17 tons. 
And, you know, there are people who say carbon footprints, which is what we're talking about, don't matter, that British Petroleum invented the term to blame us for our excess. And even Michael Mann in his book said carbon, that carbon footprints actually undermine support for substantive action. This is convenient for fossil fuel companies. And my favorite, a student, that personal accountability isn't just irrelevant, it's designed by the world's biggest polluters. We have to stop blaming everyday people and go after the fossil fuel industry. And a line you'll hear all the time is just 100 co fossil fuel companies are responsible for 71% of emissions. I've been collecting tweets on this because they're so silly. Oil companies are making the emissions. My air conditioning has nothing to do with it. Oil companies are doing it. My Bitcoin has nothing to do with it. Oil companies are doing this. So my hamburger has nothing to do with it. Right. Fact is, when you look back at that report that the Guardian article was based on, they're not oil companies, they're countries. Like the oil companies don't come until way down the line. We're dealing with China and Saudi Arabia and gas prop. But, and what they are is what's called scope one emissions and scope three. Scope three is what we buy. We're buying what they're selling. We're putting it in the tanks. If we didn't buy the gas, you know what would happen. They wouldn't be able to sell it. Now, I wrote the book all about my life, my year uh, living, trying to live a 1.5 degree lifestyle and keep my carbon budget under 2.5 tons. And after the book was published, bless these people at the IPCC, they came out with their latest report and they said the same thing. That nobody read that report. It was a complete dud. Peter Kalmus's great tweet, Earth Unlivable, story page three. But there was a lot in there that was really, really good about this that, you know, we, they said, look, things are getting better. Photo photovoltaics have dropped, onshore wind, the prices dropped, everything. We're getting more and more of it all the time. Hey, and, hey Lloyd. Yes. When, when, when they say, oh, but things are getting better, are we supposed to believe what they say or are we supposed to say, come on? Well, you've got to admit, photoelectrics have gotten cheaper. Uh, Onshore okay. wind has gotten cheaper. The adoption curves you see below, we can do this. We know what to do there. Look at those. They're straight up those lines. And they were like me talking about demand side mitigation, you know, eating less meat, uh, buying less stuff, doing all the same thing as my book. So I just put in there. And as always happens when I export to Photoshop, everything gets screwed up. When I export to PowerPoint, I mean, the report made one thing clear, the technologies and the policies necessary exist. And the obstacles are politics and the fossil fuel companies. So what I did is I basically go back to the book. I looked at all of the areas that they say are important. Food, housing, how you get around, what you buy, what you do. And I built a giant spreadsheet. Every day I tracked everything on my spreadsheet. You can see I had one January 8th. I had a big ridiculous Hungarian dinner with 7.2 kilograms of carbon footprint. No more Hungarian dinners. And I had to look at everything in terms of this. So like, let's say I go out get, get an air conditioner. An air conditioner, you know how much operating energy comes from it, but what really matters in it as well is the upfront carbon emissions of making it. You know, everybody says China's responsible for all the, the, uh, the pollution. Look at how much comes from China, but they're making all the shit that we're buying. I mean, all of that is coming to North America. So I had to go back and try and figure out the carbon footprint, the upfront carbon footprint of everything. And this is hard. I'll give you an example. This is my favorite chicken dinner that we order in a Canadian chain called Swiss Chalet. And I wanted to figure out, so what's the carbon footprint of my chicken dinner? And you'd think this would be easy, but everything and everybody in building has the same problem. You know, first there's the chickens. I can find a number in the chicken, except it was an English number and I'm in Canada and it's colder, so they probably it's going to be higher. Uh, I could figure this one out easily. I could get catalogs and figure out how big the oven is and how much gas it uses. Uh, I weighed the plastic that it all came in and found out what it weighed. And what screwed the whole thing was the delivery. This guy and his Toyota, they do it from five miles away and he's got the Toyota and I'm the only meal on it. And the transportation at the takeout dinner put everything away. So if I would normally said, OK, what's a roast chicken dinner? Most people wouldn't think the delivery is the most important factor. In For the, the first thing. time ever, I'm going to say loser, loser chicken dinner. Um, but, but, but if you would have rode your bike to go get the chicken, 
that's one of my conclusions. Never order it this way. Of course, that's what I learned. Now I'm going through these really quickly because I just want to get the book out of the way to get into the meat that what's happening, you know, and how right. we move, it's the same issue. Uh, nothing has changed in our society in 60 years. I mean, this was the American dream, what in 1960, a car, a boat and a big house. And this is the same thing in a Ford ad last year. The only difference is the car is bigger, the boat is bigger and the house is bigger. And, you know, then the dream, the American dream was your suburban house. It's out there in your car there. And today, you know, the Tesla version, the Musk version is a big suburban house with a solar roof and a solar battery in the wall and two Teslas in the garage. And if you start measuring, again, the upfront carbon to make all these things, it's insane. And there's still cars. They still block the road, the sidewalks. They still take up all the pavement. Um, and if you start looking at things like the Ford F-150 Lightning, they have a huge monster embodied carbon footprint, you know, 40 tons of carbon between the metal and the batteries and everything else. But we're car obsessed in this country, in North America. So what I did to lower my carbon footprint for the whole year is I rode my e-bike. And this is a one three hundredth the upfront carbon of the uh, Tesla, of the other car. And you have to know how to dress. This is like last winter, you know, you can't, but like if you do this, it's fine. And then there's consumption, other kinds of consumption. I happen to have an Apple fetish. I own everything that they make, except for that round little thing that my wife won't let in the house because she doesn't want them listening to me. Um, but you know, I got the watch, I got these, I've got it all. And Apple's one of the few companies that publishes the full life cycle emissions. And so I've got my iPhone Pro, my Mac, iMac, my MacBook Air, my iPad Pro, even my dopey little watch. My little watch is 38 kilograms of carbon. Dun, dun, I could lift dun. 38 kilograms. Just that. And, you know, it totaled up that this became one of the biggest parts of my of my whole emissions. And it's all upfront carbon because they take no electricity to run. Leisure, and this is my two more slides on all of this. You know, I Got used it. to love driving two hours north to get electrically winched up a hill to slide down artificial snow made with electricity and then drive back. And, you know, you realize, you know, maybe this isn't so smart. And when I was doing the study, I decided, you know, I'm going to bungee my cross-country skis to my e-bike and I'm going to go to the big park across town. I had a wonderful time. I saved money and uh, I got real exercise out of it. So the first, this first paragraph in my conclusion of my book is the important one, the only one that I really want to read here. The embodied carbon, the upfront carbon emissions from making stuff is becoming more important than the operational emissions and more so every day. My electronics use almost no energy to run, run, but the upfront carbon making them almost buried me. Same is true of our homes, our cars, our buildings, and just about anything made of metal, silicon, or concrete. It's the stuff uh -oh. you don't see, the stuff that was going into making it. This is an English from an English report on upfront country carbon, that it is the real issue that we have to deal with. So yesterday in September 22nd, I've just been distilling this and I wrote up what I called the, uh, up the ironclad rule of carbon. And for this, we've got to go back to the ironclad rule of carbon, by the way, I didn't even put it in the slide yet, was that um, as our electrical grid decarbonizes, um, and everything gets electrified, then upfront carbon emissions are going to approach 100% of all emissions. And first, we have to go back to Jimmy Carter for a minute, because we have to talk about energy. And our obsession for years, for 50 years, has been with energy, not carbon. And everything's designed, all our systems are designed around energy. You know, they, they all was political. It was all a reaction to the Arab embargo in, in 1973. Their whole issue in the United States was energy independence. It had nothing to do with anything else. That's where efficiency came from. Yep. But energy does not equal carbon. Um, again, now we're worried about carbon because of these mitigation curves. So how do we deal with carbon, not energy? It's actually different. 
And the other thing also that really bothers me is everybody talks about these curves. Oh, we have to start cutting our budget, cutting our budget, cutting our budget. But the way we're doing it in America, it's like, okay, I'm retired. I have so much money left, which is my budget. I'm going to go out and buy a yacht tomorrow. And then in 2030, I'm going to eat cat food. I mean, we don't have, uh, haven't figured out, you know, when you follow these mitigation curves, it doesn't work. You have to go back to the chart and say, it's a budget. It's a hard number. We pick one. Let's pick 1.5 degrees. We got 400 gigatons of carbon left. And every molecule, every gram, every pound of carbon that we put into the air is going against this number. And that's the fundamental point. Did my screen get weird or did your screen? Uh, no, I'm playing with it a little bit, just seeing oh, okay. what showed that graph a little bigger. Yep. So, you know, in, in 1996, everybody talked about, nobody cared about embodied carbon I mean, because the operating, you've got dirty electricity, you've got natural gas, and you've got leaky buildings. The operating energy blows the whole thing out of the water instantly. John Straub, who we'll talk about later, said very nice things, actually wrote, the ongoing consumption of energy to operate and light a building as well as the energy embodied is, is the largest single point. And he said 94% of the energy is from, uh, from operating energy. Then a few years later, as buildings started getting more efficient, people started realizing, yes, but as buildings get efficient, then the operating energy builds up more slowly and it takes much, much longer for it to overtake the embodied energy. And this is what we've been going through. The embodied energy suddenly is still smaller on this graph from a low efficiency building, but it's getting getting to be a more important number. And then this guy, Chris Magwood, came along in 2018. Do you know Chris? I think yeah, was Chris. we know Chris. Chris yeah, Chris. Uh, Chris has almost as many as slides as you, but he doesn't speak with the quickness. Uh, so he did this study studying Ontario buildings. And years ago, you know, I used to go to buildings. I've got eight inches of polyurethane foam in my building. It's not going to use any energy. And I've got many examples. And he went and he did the math on the embodied carbon of making that urethane and found that if you build a crappy house to Ontario building code, it in its lifetime has a lower total carbon footprint than the one that was heated done with the urethane. And as one builder said in a magazine, it was like a light turning on. Everything we've been doing has been wrong. And he did the same thing again here showing if you've got a heat pump, I mean, look at the difference between a typical build and a high performance build. Now, people, this is one of the things people have been attacking, attacking me about since yesterday, but we'll get back to that, which is, you know, you're promoting low inefficient buildings. I said, no, I'm not. But look at what they used to do. This is a passive house from about five years ago. The whole thing is made of foam. The entire thing is made of foam bolted together. I mean, if you actually knew anything about embodied carbon, you would say, this has got to be the stupidest building that was ever built. It like, but it's a, like 100% foam bolted together. It's wild. And they thought they were building a great passive house. So this is why- hey, By the way, it is sexy looking. Um, oh, yes. So. <laughs> so this is from an English report from Architect ACAN, Architects for Climate Action in the UK, that started looking at this thing again, how really the upfront carbon is becoming more and more important all the time. And they started pointing out last year you know, that as codes get tighter, it's going to go up. So if it's now at 55%, when we get buildings that are all electric built out of wood, it's going to be higher. And I didn't, they did this chart where it showed that big bar at the front and the lifestyle. And I really didn't believe it. I actually went and measured all of those little gray boxes and piled them up on the side to see, is this really true? Is the operational bigger than embodied and the embodied bigger? And it is. And because as our codes get gray, uh, uh, as our energy supply gets greener, like this is our local gas uh, coal plant getting blown up a few years ago, the energy gets cleaner to where, where I live in Ontario, it's 94% carbon free. So I did this strong two nights ago, just to try and say that, look what's happening. If you've got natural gas or a car running on gasoline, um, it blows it out really quickly. Um, if you've got a heat pump, but you've got dirty electricity, uh, it might go out there by 2035. It's still going to be bigger. But if you've got clean electricity and you've got a heat pump and the heat pump isn't leaking refrigerant, another thing I got yelled at, then 
the upfront carbon is almost the entire problem. It's all wow. in what you build. Now, why well, keep saying upfront carbon instead of embodied carbon, by the way, I should explain that I had a debate with uh, an, uh, uh, two other architects about how embodied carbon is a stupid name because it's not embodied, it's in the air. People aren't gonna understand it. When you said embodied energy, people understand electricity goes in, but embodied carbon makes no sense. So Elrond said, we'll call it burped carbon, vomited carbon, spiked carbon. It's not, it's in the atmosphere, but we settled all on upfront carbon emissions because what's happening up front. And it's- I think that clarification is important because um, it's not semantics, right? It's, it's, it's misunderstanding and misunderstanding doesn't move people to the next step. We've fought this for years with other acronyms and whatnot. Upfront carbon, that makes sense, right, Dave? It does make sense. And it's becoming accepted. This is a Canadian version uh, of the English. This was the first where they actually built their report around it uh, and used it. And they said, yes, we got it from you. They say now that upfront carbon is just, there's still embodied carbon after an end of life and the use, but the upfront carbon is before it opens. And this is the graph they did where you can see upfront carbon with the asterisk to explain why they called it upfront. And nobody is taking it into account. Nobody is taking it seriously. Even the toughest system of all, the Living Building Challenge, says um, you have to measure it and you have to buy a carbon offset for it. Really? Uh, the uh, Canadians here are saying um, it's still a relatively low proportion of the building's plural footprint, but you have to measure it. No! Uh, Leeds says uh, you have to measure it, but they don't. If it wasn't it. important, why are they still saying you have to measure it? Exactly. And it is. And it changes the way you think about buildings. Like what happens when you design with it in mind? Uh, this was a building called the Tulip designed by Norman Foster, which is basically a restaurant cool. and a stick, a, a restaurant and a stick in London that nobody needs. And it was going to be this thing. And it's actually the first building in the world that was actually killed because the people looking at it, you, say, you know how much concrete is going in to hold this stupid thing up in the air? This is a ridiculous waste of embodied carbon and they canceled it, which is great. Why do we the need a giant Q-tip? No one can yes. even use that big of a Q-tip. In Toronto, we had a whole rail system designed, but we had the stupid mayor, Rob Ford, who hated streetcars because they slowed him down. And then his brother became head of the whole province. So they canceled the whole streetcar line. And even in the middle of the suburbs where there's no traffic and the road is wide enough for a streetcar, they're burying it because there's no space on the service. No, because on the odd chance, someone will be inconvenienced. So I still say the reason car. we have the problems we have today is because the auto companies eliminated the streetcar. Yeah. And here we are. You know, this is building these giant tunnels just for streetcars. When Toronto still has streetcars, <clears throat> these could be all over the city. We're knocking down buildings and replacing. This is a this is a building in New York that was done in 1960 by the big, biggest woman, built, biggest building ever done by a female architect, by the way, Natalie DeBlois, there with Philip Johnson. And it was a big building, J.P. Morgan's, and they wanted a bigger building. So this building, though, was lead platinum renovated just 10 years ago. And to lead platinum renovate a building, you got to take it down to the bones. This building was basically barely under war, out of warranty, and they were taking it down. It's insanity, and that's pure embodied carbon. And they're doing this all over Toronto now because of ridiculous zoning that protects single-family housing. They're knocking down 20-story buildings to build 60-story buildings. Stop it's ridiculous. doing that. Yes. And it's the same with cars. You would not build so many. You know, this is a great ad to show how little it is understood by the car industry. Hyundai read, wrote an ad. Why shouldn't a car have the same emissions as a bike? And some graffiti person went on because of the carbon embodied in the materials. I mean, the person walking on the street knows more than Hyundai about what goes what embodied carbon is. <laughs> That's funny. And then we're building these trucks. And I, I got in real trouble when I wrote about, you know, I did the math and I figured, you know, if I take my little Toyota Echo that I inherited from my mom and I figure out its mileage and how much metal it is. Um, what have I lost in the next slide? Oh, did it? Did, did, did the, it the, only the automotive please grab your slide? 
Oh, it, it, it cut us off, huh? Yeah, it's only a hunt. Let me see. It, oh, the sure automakers are on your tail, Lloyd. They Whatever wanted you to shut up. They just shut you down. Let's and like I'm that. on time. I'm on time. Okay. Why don't you entertain your audience for two minutes? I will go to Google and see if they happen. And if not, I will export the rest of the slides to Google. Like, is awesome. that okay with you? So, yeah, yeah. So go for it. Go for it. That, Lloyd, Dave's going to pull up some um, hellos and shout outs to the people that are taking rapid fire notes. And we'll have Sean with us while we do it. Hey, hey guys. Um, I'm at another job site where, uh, you know, we're, we're digging. And uh, unfortunately, as Lloyd talked about, we're, uh, Again, we got a lot of concrete in the basement that I wish we could just get rid of basements and get in the air and reduce our material carbon footprint. Um, and uh, again, I, I appreciate that you guys have worked on a lot of these subjects. You know, we had you guys had Chris Magwood on and he uh, dove into a lot of the stuff here. And uh, and hopefully you guys are going to plan to buy Lloyd's book and either ask for it to put on your Christmas tree or borrow it from one of your friends because it's a great book. Actually, I've let my copy out. I don't even have mine with me because I had to. I had to, again, get the message out there that Lloyd's talking about. I well, you already read it. it. You don't need it anymore. Share it. I sleep on it, it at night so so that it gets inside of here. It's um... <laughs> yeah. But I'm inspired by the uh, the e-bike uh, Maybe Christmas. Um, again, I unfortunately, I uh, I definitely have signed up for the electric car, but I totally hear Lloyd. I Every time I see electric bike, I think of Lloyd. I'm like, Sean, Lloyd's talking to you. You got to get your electric bike and you got to work on <laughs> on changing the, your mode of methods. So love it. Love so it. Dave, Dave went one step further when he goes fishing, he uses a fishing rod that requires no electric, right? So it's None. just human power to catch that fish. And yeah, on an end of, on, 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 a, on a bamboo pole. On a bamboo, yeah. I, that's what I learned on. So in, in Wisconsin, when I was younger, if you have the bamboo pole, so not yeah. a rod and reel, you did not, need a fishing license really that's the interesting yeah, yeah, yeah. Required the fishing license oh, i love that oh i see lloyd has more stuff coming up here no this isn't uh this didn't work no, I, I can see I, thought I erased all the first slides oh yeah and thought that i would just then retranslate it but i have to save it again so keep talking i'm almost there yeah. got it got it got it why don't we give a few hellos while we're waiting there everyone what do you think? What do you think? We got Andrew Seely joining us. What is up, Andrew Seely? He almost deserves the air horn. Should we give him an air horn? Yeah, let's give him an air horn. All right. Oh, yeah. You know what? Mark has his own soundboard, but he's not going to. You can't share it yet. <laughs> nine, nine, pre 19, like 80s Radio Shack de-stressor can you believe they had de-stressors back then and mark yeah. had one so maybe he was stressed 1983 yeah there it goes i was pretty Beauty. close i was pretty close what's happening andrew Seely? we got michael bruce out there as well good afternoon to you buzz howitzer is in the house what's up buzz hope all is well my friend love all those phs yeah, Skyler Swinford. Skyler. This slide needs an asterisk. Don't know which one he was talking about there, all but there's a few of them that could have used them. them. Yeah. 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 Michael Bruce says, uh, this is great. He should have his own show in Vegas. All kidding aside, he does make some very good points about the human effect on the planet since we discovered chemistry and physics. So appreciate everybody uh, tuning in. If you do have a comment or questions, feel free to put it in the comment section there, and we will try and get to you and put you up on the show. Vegas, uh, talk about embodied carbon, right? Those buildings yeah. are coming down as well, and we know when they were built because it used to be a desert. Yeah. Desert. Um, and, and again, talking you, about uh, conferences, I mean, Lloyd's... Oh, yeah, let me look, Lloyd. Oh. Sorry, Dave, can you can you delete those two there? It won't let me upload because it says I can't upload a third. As oh, a guest just... user, user, I can only upload... Oh, shit. I deleted him. You deleted okay. Lloyd. Oh, poop. Sorry, did I, did I swear on live... Dave Cooper live. You know I what? It, 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 I was a, it's a good part to put a poop emoji. You, 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 haven't, you haven't used one of those yet. I, yeah, I need. I don't have one lined up. I don't have a poop emoji. Oh, He'll yeah. come back in. He knows where. He knows what to do. Yeah. That's one of those trombone moments. <laughs> Mark, that's Mark good has one, a bomb. Mark. Yeah, I bombed yeah. that one, didn't I? 
<laughs> I think that's the first time I ever kicked a guest with his slides, too. <laughs> Hopefully in his parachute. Hopefully yeah, he lands yeah. safely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know why I kicked him. I was just kicking the slideshow, but whatever. Yeah. We'll figure it out. Hopefully I didn't ban him because there's an accidental ban button, too. Like, you can ban oh, someone. No. Uh, Sean, oh, Sean and I know back. about the <laughs> accidental ban. Oh, I don't know what I did to you, Lloyd, but <laughs> geez almighty. It's all right. I think we're ready. Let me just give me one more second to share this. Pick this Full one eject. Da Daimler <laughs> Chrysler uh, issued a warning on, <laughs> on, uh, on, on streetcar discussions. Yeah, that's, it. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. All right. So very, very cool. Where are you heading to next, Sean? Uh, You're not getting much work done sitting in your car. Well, again, we uh, we're we're actually waiting for the city to show up to talk about this tree that's in the way. Yeah, uh -huh, so of course, we, waiting for one of those conversations. So does the tree have to stay, or does the tree have to go? Tree needs to go. It's right in the front door. So ah. so so make a make an exchange that the tree will turn into a nice set of benches and you'll plant three uh, Me, instead. And I'll, uh, I'll raise right. you. We actually got to do six six trees. Is that a Vancouver policy? Six. Uh, this is a, uh So we're currently in the city of North Vancouver. Oh, I right. was That's I was good. in the district of North Vancouver, and the city here it mandates that uh, it's six trees to replace this one. I'll, I'll tell you and what. In three Toronto, on the property, and three in the uh, in the neighborhood. In in Toronto, those front parkways, how they protect trees. I mean, consider adding twenty five k to your housing budget to protect the trees. You know this, Lloyd. I mean, tree yep. hugger personified. Yeah. Um, so almost there. By the way, it made okay. me log in and do all this other crap. I don't. Want no, to. no, no worries. No worries. So you got to words can we just say today on the show? We've we're at three. So let's three. just keep keep those continuing. We've described poop in all different forms so far today. Feces? Uh, have we said feces? Oh, there you go. That's four. And we like that one because that's with a pH. So we got, <laughs> we got four on the board. <laughs> yeah, leave fart, leave it to the offside guy. The oh, he oh, logged no, himself out now. Void. That wasn't me. I touched nothing. Well, <laughs> and, and like you say, Dave, when you're live, anything can happen. And this is just the commercial. So uh, maybe uh, you can give a quick update, like give a commercial of what you've been up to this week and and what's – what's. are we doing coffee with bomp, you tomorrow? Bomp, bomp. I'm actually going to a private event tonight with Module. We have uh, the Secretary of Energy and everybody in Pittsburgh for a really big event right now. So wow. we're going to go hang out with all of them, Bill Gates and some others, I guess. So we'll see what's going yeah. on. I don't know if Bill Gates is going to be there, but it's fun to say that because he might be. Yeah. I don't know. But he, he, was, he was here. They were all in Pittsburgh, John Kerry and Bill Gates. And it's a list of who's who's in the world by the DOE from the Department uh, of Energy. Uh, I well, have I'm some glad you made the list. stories that I won't share. Lloyd's back. This is insane. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do what I do really well. I'm going to talk. I'm just going to sit here and I'm just going to talk without slides because this is impossible. Perfect. And, okay. So... Here I am again, sorry about all that. Anyhow, after I did that whole research into the carbon footprint of a car, uh, I, my boss, I now work for the biggest English language publishing company in the world. We've been bought and bought and bought. And the boss of the whole damn thing said, what are you guys doing writing about electric cars aren't as good as little gas powered cars? Nobody in America wants a little gas powered car and this can't be true. And we want to promote electric cars. And I said, no, we want to promote Small cars, small electric cars, other things. We can't be promoting these big beasts. They're a problem. And the problem extends through everything that we do, everything that we have. Um, you know, if you thought about your upfront carbon, like I've been doing, you wouldn't anymore be buying every new Apple Watch and every new thing. You'd be trying to make them last, to spread that carbon over the life of the product. Uh, you wouldn't build out of concrete and steel. Uh, and you would instead build out of wood. Um, concrete, you know, the thing about steel, there's talk of people saying, oh, they're going to make it with hydrogen and things like that and green steel. But right now it's basically a chemistry problem. They not only have to melt the steel, but they have to dump coal into the blast furnace to have the carbon to combine with the oxygen that comes off the hematite, the ore, to make carbon dioxide that goes into the air. It's chemistry. It's really hard to change chemistry. They proposed by replacing it with hydrogen. And there was an article yesterday that decarbonizing the global steel industry would require 600 gigawatts of hydrogen electrolyzers. Uh, 
which is about 2,000 times at times as many as they think they're going to have in the next 10 years. I'm Happy glad you explained that. Uh, there was a proposal, and this might be built by now, years ago for an all-electric um, steel plant in Michigan. They were trying to bring that. I don't know if it ever happened, but um, in, in, in terms of that carbon question for steel, Lloyd, since they're, since they're still going to keep using it, does it make sense to produce it on the continents it's being used on, or does it make sense to send it over the ocean? As a it carbon sense, question. It, it makes sense. A company in Boston has just figured out and is testing a way to make it with electricity, uh, straight with electricity in much the same way you do with aluminum, and just a form of electrolysis. And then if that process works, it'll make sense to send the iron ore to where the electricity is clean, like to Quebec or to Iceland or to parts of Russia or Norway. Uh, may become centers of it, just like it makes sense to do it with uh, aluminum. Uh, you know, uh, concrete has a chemistry problem too. Uh, half of the carbon that's released that is the chemical reaction of converting the limestone uh, to uh, usable lime that goes into the concrete. And there's talks about technology to do that as well, to fix that, uh, this new Alesis process that Apple funded and Justin Trudeau funded that Basically, the fact is, is that also aluminum has carbon uh, anodes and cathodes in the cells. So it's the same reaction. The carbon blends with the oxygen that comes from the alumina to make carbon dioxide. So we have to use less of it. And, you know, the fact of the matter is we keep thinking of the aluminum can as the problem in the waste. But like 26 percent of aluminum uh, goes into transport, mostly airplanes and also Ford F-150s. 26 uh, percent goes into buildings, into our window frames and our curtain walls and stuff like that. And only 7 percent goes into packaging. So when all my complaining for years about tin cans, it's really almost meaningless. Wow. And here here I'm showing pictures of buildings and window frames and we'll ignore that. The real problem also with aluminum is that even though 76% of it gets recycled, the demand for it is growing all the time. And so they have to keep making virgin aluminum. There's not enough recycled aluminum. A lot of companies won't use recycled aluminum. Apple can't, doesn't have the qualities that they need, that they, the tolerances they need. Ford doesn't like it for the cars. They're worried about it won't be good enough. So a lot of virgin aluminum, and that means mining bauxite and separating the red mud and poisoning people all over the world. So we've got to stop that. I, I like yeah. when at the end of those sentences, you say those things, right? Mining this and poisoning this, because you're saying all those effects that we don't think about with tin can this and plastic bottle that. And at the end of the day, I don't want to sound crazy, but I'm going to sound direct. We don't need aluminum cans and plastic bottles to begin with. No, exactly. We never had them I growing up. We don't when need I them. have my normal slideshow, I show all the Coca-Cola bottling companies in every city because they had to pick up the bottles and the breweries in every city. In Ontario, Canada, O'Keefe Ale had five breweries for one little, pro well, one big province. Then they got bought by Molson's, which got bought with Coors. And now all the beers made in like one giant plant in Colorado. And it's nuts. And we're shipping it all over the country because we're able to, because Dwight Eisenhower built the defense highway network, which made it cheap for everything to go by that. And everything is more gas, more gas, more gas. Now we come to wood. And here I'm showing cross laminated timber and go through a couple of these that this is the way to build. We should be all building with five cross laminated There's timber. There's something about that water. Timber and mass timber. But, you know, sorry. I was saying there's something about the water in Ontario because there's a strong resemblance to your delivery and uh, and 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 Susan Raleigh's your timeline of data and insight is the <laughs> most unique we've ever had. I Thank love you. Susan. She's great. 
so here I'm showing all pictures of mass timber on my slideshow, which you're not seeing. And you're seeing mass timber buildings that are clad in glass now because they want everybody to look up and see all the timber through the facades. So you're getting all of these glass mass timber buildings. As Monty Paulson says, glass boxes are horrible buildings. Glass boxes on wood frames are still horrible buildings. Mass timber does not meaningfully reduce the lifetime emissions of a glass box. And anyone who tells you otherwise is gaslighting. So got to do that. And Stop the, the other... glass buildings. Stop the glass buildings. Yes. And then, you know, when you look at what they're doing in Sweden, where they basically do everything in modular and panelized robotic wood framing, that is just fantastic. They get precision. Everything goes together perfectly. The quality is fantastic. And going with sticks cuts your fiber in by a fifth. That's one fifth the amount of fiber to go stick frame than it is to go with mass timber. And so anyone who's building three and four story buildings out of mass timber is doing it for looks. They're doing it for fun. They're doing it for architecture, but it's not a better way to build. And then well, I actually it does. show a picture of tea studs. You know, the goal of show, the reason I put in the picture of the tea studs is because the fundamental thing we should be doing with everything we do, with everything we design, is using as little material as possible. So if you build your building, I, I, it should be as to, compact as to, possible. And if you build your wall, it should use as little wood as possible. To defend the mass timber and the heavy timber uh, rationale is at the buildup that they use it it does suffice into the structure and to the fire code. So uh, I, I forget the year, but wasn't it the early 1800s that we introduced the actual heavy timber? Mass timber is a, yeah. still a marketing term, but the heavy timber into it. And it was because of the, the industrial strength of the buildings and, and and the fire code. So we also didn't have gypsum then, folks. Not in no, that form. Or sprinklers. So yeah. a different world. But, you know, we still should, everything you do, reduce the amount of material you use. I then show what I'm showing as a picture of, you know, the, the vertical the vertical forest, the, the Bosco ver Vertical in, um, in Milan, which you can look up 57 brochures or websites on green housing. And I show a picture of a green building, maybe the key to affordable housing. And they show a picture of this building in there. This building to hold up those trees has three times as much concrete on every balcony as anyone would ever need. I, you know, it's incredible. And I was showing a picture that just, I was just pitched of a new installation of a Valcuni, uh, Valcuccini kitchen in, the, uh, in this building, which they're calling a sustainable kitchen. And 10 years ago, I was at a show in New York and I asked, you know, what makes this kitchen Sustainable, and the guy said, it will last forever. It's made of glass, solid glass. Your grandchildren will be using this kitchen. Well, the embodied carbon of glass, you know, compared to what we build kitchens out of normally is insanely high. It makes absolutely no sense. So to call a concrete building sustainable because it's covered in trees and a glass kitchen sustainable because your grandkids will use it makes no sense. Lloyd, I so, have a question for you. Yes. Th this is this is a glimpse in time. David, Sean might know this. In the, if we take ourselves into the Wayback Machine right now, a company called Heineken developed a bottle that, after you know being forced to consume your wobbly pop, you can use the bottle to produce walls in your structure. Y'all remember that? Yep, I do. Yeah, the the, the Heineken brick. Yep. But the Heineken brick didn't make as much sense as sending the bottle back to the brewery to refill it, which is what we do in Canada. And or we did. I mean, in Ontario, they're trying to kill it. Um, I'm sorry the last few slides aren't working. I can't show you here because, you know, I basically show a building in Britain that's mostly made out of uh, straw and wood and thatch. And it's a school. It's not even a house. Uh, it's got a material palette of these materials, it looks like you can sort of cut them up and pour milk on them and eat this building for breakfast. It really all natural materials in this thing. Uh, and stone, a lot of people are talking about stone that actually it's almost no added energy when you cut stone. I thought it's really heavy. You don't want to build out of stone. Um, but the ultimate point that I was making in my whole thing was that as the, 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 up, the rule of upfront carbon 
the ironclad rule of upfront carbon again in summary was is that as we do green our electrical supply and we're not burning gas we're burning electricity uh, and the electricity is clean then really what we're left that we have to worry about most is the upfront carbon what we build with which means we have to build with materials with low footprints in them. We have to design buildings to be as simple as possible, to use the minimum amount of energy. We have to think about sufficiency. How much do we really need to do this? Now, I published this yesterday. You can look at it in Treehugger. Uh, and, uh, you know, John Straub, the well-known engineer said, fantastic and profoundly important article that is so well written, I must read. And then the next one I quote here came in today. Lloyd, there are so many issues with your article. My jaw dropped when I read it. I've been a long time admirer, but you got way ahead of the math on this one. And <laughs> it's somewhere in the middle. Well, in good. The end, in the end, the rules that I go by came out of that upfront carbon report. And this was my last slide that you're not seeing. But the first thing you do is build nothing or buy nothing. Do you need yes. this? Do you have to have it? No. The next thing you do is build less, buy less, maximize the use of existing assets, rebuild them, do what you can with them. Then you build clever, optimize material usage and design with low carbon materials. And then you build efficiently using low carbon construction to uh, technologies to eliminate waste. And finally, design for deconstruction, design for dematerialization, disassembly, so that at some point, like I don't have to throw away this watch. I can get it fixed. I don't need to buy a new iPad, I, uh, iPhone. I can get it fixed. And the same with our buildings. I, we can take them apart and use them again. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry about the slides. Bro. You're, you're, oh, that's you're, okay. Uh, this was amazing. Yeah. Lloyd, here's a funny insight for you. I spoke at the uh, waste management um, and recycling conference, and I got, I got banned for life. Um, their topic was... Y Y'all remember the three R's, right? Reduce, reuse, recycle. That was their big thing. And I put those down my list of, of refuse, rethink, reduce. Those were the first three steps. And they were like, no, no, it's reduce, reuse, recycle. Re we need the yeah. recycling. And I was like, no, that's later down. And it was a, it was a fire and brimstone kind of thing happening. Um, and I've had that happen to me. I, yep. I know it well. I mean, I we refuse to use the word recycling on tree hugger, and we add reject. We don't have to accept this shit from these people. We reject it, and that I think is one of the most important R's. You know, I wrote a very controversial article that they actually put the whole title in tree hugger back years ago called recycling is bullshit and basically went through all of this how the recycling industry has trained us to pick up their garbage uh yeah. and break it into little piles we're doing their work as taxpayers when it should be producer responsibility you take back lloyd uh <laughs> I, I, i'm i'm On behalf it. of the audience, <laughs> um, uh, we want to thank you for being here today. I I encourage people, do not make it through the day without uh, logging on to and following Tree Hugger. Yeah. If John Straub answers an article like that, um, think about it. And, and by the way, John Straub is also very funny. People wouldn't think yes. about that. Yeah, He's yeah, an yes. engineer. Um he went through uh, Germany School of Comedy, so he knows. And uh, I'll tell you what, Lloyd, we're 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 ready for 2023. That was a teaser technique, folks, that you didn't get to see those slides because we want you back to see Lloyd next time. <laughs> uh, Dave, Sean, I'm covering my microphone because I'm in awe. I don't. I think this is the first show that if I said more than ten words because I was listening. Uh, is a lot. And, and, and I was not only listening, I was entertained. Lloyd, you are entertaining yeah. when you yeah. speak. So there's no wonder oh, people you. would like to see you uh, stand on stage or give presentations. But Lloyd not only in Vegas, not a, Lloyd in Vegas, Lloyd yeah. in Vegas, <laughs> Lloyd in Vegas. Yeah, somebody had somebody had that comment. But I, I do I do believe, you know, part of Passive House, part of sustainability in this is having somebody that can take what could be a really boring and draining subject and make it fun and exciting and really be able to put all the parts and pieces together. And I think that's what you do so great.
Yeah, Lloyd, I really appreciate how you get people to think. Uh, I know, again, reading your book and reading Tree Hugger, you know, daily, um, you really put a great spin of things and really poignant. And uh, we are lucky to have your fingers type your uh, the stuff coming out of your head because we are lucky to be involved and, and to have you in our life. So thanks, Lloyd. Oh, thanks, Sean. Yeah, we got Julian Brown Bowron in the house as well. What's happening, Julian? Thank you for joining us today. Make sure we give a quick shout out. All right, that's a wrap, everybody. Here we are. We're at our hour mark. We had a lot of fun. We're going to have Lloyd alter back so we can see the remaining 50 or 49 <laughs> slides that we can go through. It should only be about a five minute show if that's the case. So right. <laughs> we'll have we'll have a kind of a break in. We'll just bring them on as the introduction of another show. What do you think, Mark? I think I, I think we could do this every Friday. We'll have two part specials. The five minutes of Lloyd kicking off the next person. So Mark Parley next week. I'm sorry. <laughs> Lloyd's gonna Lloyd's gonna stomp on your turf, brother. I love it. I love it. All right. Listen, we have Autoval coming on Monday. We have a hot off the press uh, conversation coming up this Monday with Rick Murdoch and the team at Autoval. I don't know where they're at, but they were at about $110 million in their fully robotic automated house building manufacturing facility. So let's see what they have going on. And then uh, this weekend's a busy weekend. So you might see a quick coffee with Dave. Maybe it'll be an espresso with Dave. That's when we do a short show espresso with dave so short bring show. your coffee short show short show yeah you know hey it's hockey season and now our kids are all in three different directions so family family over coffee with dave that's how it's going to work and that's all three of your kids play hockey and two of them are on the same team right they are two of them are on the same team and the third one is uh playing for the little penguins he made the little penguins uh he didn't make it and let's, let's be real here it's uh peewee hot you know like learn to play hockey but he's having fun with it he gets to wear the penguin shirt and if you're a hockey fan guess who his coach is mario lemieux no we was no, it's not Mario Lemieux. Uh, Tyler Kennedy, his son's hey, playing with him. There you go, good Canadian kid. That was my, that yeah. was my second guess. Yeah, Tyler Tyler Kennedy's there. How many Kasich would make a great coach? The head coach is a guy named Rocky. He used to play for Montreal back in the day. He's in his 60s now. So, and he used to play for the Penguins. So, it's a really great program, all hand picked by uh, the Penguins organization. So wonderful. That's what we're doing this weekend. You guys got anything fun this weekend? Uh, right. It's a dead daughter weekend in my world. Are you e-biking? Are you going to e-bike for some chicken? Yeah, I'm going to e-bike for some chicken for sure. Good, good, good. <laughs> I love it. Lloyd, thanks so much for joining us. Everybody else will definitely see you on Monday with AutoVol, so make sure you join us. Mark, Sean, have a great weekend as well. Lloyd, if you want to stick around for a wrap-up at the end with uh, Mark and Sean, guys, I got to hop. I got to go to this other event this afternoon for a little bit, and then I got a hockey game at 9 o'clock tonight to go to. So with that said, you guys chat it up. I'm going to leave you right here, and everybody else have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Appreciate you, Sean. See you guys. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Lloyd. Thanks, Sean.